Staggering under a colossal debt, bent to the will of a handful of scheming men. Weary, blood-soaked Europe was ready in 1918 to be molded into any shape which would ensure lasting peace. Some innocent people thought that was what the peacemakers were doing at Versailles. But the new boundaries sowed the seeds of new hatreds. From these hatreds, a small band of men, the armament makers, the dealers in death, have reaped a golden harvest. Today, Europe is seething with unsettled controversies and dangerous discontent. The Franco-German border, the Austro-German and Yugoslav frontiers, the Polish corridor are loaded with dynamite, ready to blow up. Germany is encircled by an iron ring of armed nations, frightened and prepared. There are more men under arms today than ever before. A new generation of manhood is marching through Europe with fixed bayonets. France has seven million men ready, including her reserves. Great Britain, over a million. Russia, over 16 million, including her trained reserves. With dictator Stalin at the head. Italy has eight million soldiers, not including her eight-year-old recruits, all under Mussolini. Germany, allowed a standing army of only 100,000, has 5 million in reserve under Hitler. Japan, over 2 million. China, 2 million and an untapped reserve of millions more. Austria, 30,000 and growing under Starhemberg. In Turkey, there are 700,000 with Mustafa Kemal Pasha at the head. Czechoslovakia has a French-trained army of 1,700,000. 
At sea, the naval armament race is in full swing. Great Britain adds to her mighty fleet. Her shipyards hum with activity. Very happy. Japanese big Navy men want equality of sea power, and they're out to get it. They'd rather scrap the Washington Treaty than scrap one ship of their fleet. Restricted from launching big battleships, Germany built these 10,000-ton pocket ships. They are faster, more modern, and deadlier than any devised by the larger powers. And the race is on. Here is a continent covered with huge factories making munitions. It's Europe's biggest and most powerful industry. In England, there is Vickers Armstrong, called the stepmother of Parliament, a billion-dollar corporation. Schneider Gruso in France is the real giant of the armament world, doing a gross business of over six and a half billion francs annually. In Germany, there is Krupp, a name almost synonymous with munitions. In every country on the continent, dozens of plants working at top speed. Europe's greatest business. Its market is war and the preparation for war. Governments are its customers. Soldiers and civilians, its ultimate consumers. The sun never sets on Vickers Armstrong. Founded over a century ago, this monster enterprise has grown from a small iron works to an industrial empire reaching out to every corner of the globe. Is there a war in the Far East? Vickers fills millions of dollars worth of orders. The South America want a revolution? Vickers supplies its share of the death-dealing implements. Its relations with the British Army, the Navy, and the peerage are more than cordial. To this firm goes the credit for making England one of the world's leading exporters of arms. Krupp, under the Treaty of Versailles, was forbidden to make armaments. Supposedly engaged in the manufacture of nothing but peaceful industrial products, this German firm is actually rearming Germany to the tune of more than 100 millions annually. The treaty put Krupp out of the arms business at home, but it didn't forbid the operation of munitions factories in other countries. So plants were set up in Holland and Sweden. Krupp's super salesmen canvassed the world's markets and have made South America and the Orient into excellent customers. Some of Germany's late allies and even a few of her former enemies are doing business with Krupp once more in defiance of the Versailles Treaty. Just to keep the balance of trade straight, Krupp imports rifles, airplane engines, chemicals, and dynamite from the French-owned Skoda Works in Czechoslovakia. But the most alert munitions boys of them all are Schneider Cruzo. There's no weapon of death this French firm does not make. Airplanes, artillery, submarines, complete battleships. This firm owns banks, mines, railroads, power trusts, cable companies, automobile and chemical factories, ships, and newspapers. Its customers are in every hemisphere, its agents in every country from China to Peru. But France is by far its biggest buyer. Here she modernizes her arms, assembles her gigantic air fleet, builds bigger tanks, and develops her chemical warfare. Outside of France, Schneider Cruzo is equally powerful. Heading its 230 international subsidiaries is Skoda in Czechoslovakia. Once, Skoda was Austria's great armament factory. Now it supplies Yugoslavia, Spain, Switzerland, South America, and even France, Belgium, and Italy. Forty percent of its goods are exported. Into every corner of Europe, the armament octopus spreads its tentacles. Genuine brothers in arms they are, an international fraternity enmeshed in interlocking directorates and working with common capital. Vickers Armstrong and Schneider Cruzo are joint owners of one company. Schneider owns half the shares of Skoda. Krupp owns both ores of Sweden and has stock in Vickers. All closely related, these munitions magnets work together for a common end. More wars and more profits. Just one happy family. And now meet the big shot himself, Sir Basil Zaharoff, mystery man of Europe, maker of kings and the greatest munitions salesman ever known. Of Zaharoff, it has been said that the tombstones of millions killed in munitions he sold will form his monument, and their dying groans shall be his epitaph. Before the war, Krupp invented a special fuse for hand grenades. 
But during the war, Vickers, the English company, used this invention to turn out grenades to kill German soldiers. When the war was over, Hurt sued Vickers for infringement of patent rights, asking a shilling a fuse for killing their own people. This suit was settled out of court, with Hurt getting their share of the blood money. Scientists were working night and day on new inventions which would make death quicker and devastate more country in less time. Progress. Progress in destruction and bigger profits. time while heroes were being made on the battlefields, dead heroes and live ones, a tragic comedy was being played behind the scenes. The armament manufacturers were the actors. The international fraternity was doing its best bit of fraternizing. Germany needed nickel and copper and aluminum to manufacture these guns and shells. She didn't have enough glycerin for her gunpowder. That shortage might have ended the war sooner. But would producers in enemy countries let a little thing like that stop the war? If Germany needed copper and nickel to carry on the war, the French munitions boys would say her with it. Not too openly, of course, but every country has a back door. Switzerland was the path to Germany. So metal ore was shipped by French arms makers into Switzerland. In Switzerland, the French trademarks were replaced by Swiss labels. Then the train moved on into Germany, and German munitioners were safe. They had French raw materials to kill more French soldiers. The arms makers believed in friendly cooperation between competitors. When French members of the fraternity needed raw materials, their German brothers in arms did as much for them. By this reciprocal exchange of material, the war was kept going and business was at its peak. In spite of the blockade of German ports by the British Navy, in spite of the rigorous Allied control of the world's metal supplies, Krupp was able to obtain the essential raw materials for its war factories. The Swiss and the Swedes, the Americans and all the other broad-minded neutrals participated in the international commerce which made it possible to continue the war as Zaroff said, until the very end. French nickel and copper was being shipped back to France, all right. All wrapped up in a nice big shell. Shot back with the compliments of the Germans. And here is the munitions racket in all its power and glory. Early in the war, the Germans captured the French town of Brie, near Verdun, where tremendous mines and iron smelters were located. These mines and smelters supplied the iron that made the guns that killed French soldiers. Now, you would have thought that the French would have recaptured this territory or else blown it to kingdom come, like the villages all around it. But no, they deliberately avoided shelling Briette. A general who tried it was replaced by one who let it strictly alone. The Germans were equally kind to the town of Dumbasel, further south, where the French had their own great iron mines and smelters. There was a gentleman's agreement that if the French left Brie alone, the Germans would spare Dombas. With devastation all around them, Brie and Dombas survived the war without a scratch. Seems incredible, but the facts were brought out after the armistice by French officers who had wanted to shell Brie and had been told in no uncertain terms that a hands-off policy was in effect. And while men were dying like flies at nearby Verdun, the mines and smelters of Brie were left intact so that the war and the profits might continue. If Brie had been shelled, the Germans wouldn't have had sufficient raw materials to continue fighting. But it wasn't. And so the war lasted two years longer. Ten million men paid with their lives so that business might go on as usual. It cost $25,000 to kill each soldier in the last war.
Munitions plants reached a new peak of activity. Profits skyrocketed. In France, in Germany, in England and America, everywhere, amazing fortunes were piled up. The stock exchanges concealed the market value of munition stocks. Profits increased in direct proportion to the ever-growing lists of dead and wounded. Stock prices and casualty lists skyrocketed together. It was a pagan holiday for the dealers in debt. conference at Versailles followed. It looked as though with the signing of the Versailles Treaty, this war racket at last was over. What would the poor arms makers do now? They had had a taste of blood, and they shuddered at the prospect of lean days ahead as they watched the peacemakers carve out a new Europe. Maybe their profits would be carved out too. The arms racketeers need not have been perturbed. At the very time Wilson, Clemenceau, Lloyd George, and the others were drawing up the Versailles Treaty, New wars were breaking out all over the map. The Bolsheviks were the new enemy, and fresh guns were trained on Petrograd and Moscow. First came Admiral Kolchak's offensive, then the wars in Siberia. First Kolchak, then Yudinich, Generals Denikin, and finally Rangel. All received English, French, and American arms. The Allies were meddling in Russian affairs, financing white armies, north, east, and south, unleashing a new war frenzy. While the Allies talked peace in Paris, a revolution in Hungary brought the Romanians and Hungarians together in another nasty little war. In Poland, Pilsudski's troops were fighting the Red Russians in still another. Never stopping, these arms manufacturers went right on about their business. The world might be in the grip of a post-war depression with millions out of work and governments unable to pay their debts. But the munitions makers continue to prolong war, disturb peace, and make money. And with them, the gun making business. makers didn't care to what end their products came. They were reaping enormous dividends, which the youth of the world were earning for them on the battlefields of Europe. The United States alone spent more than half a billion dollars for automatics and three quarters of a billion for ammunition. dumps were piled high with hundreds of thousands of $25 rifles and $1,300 bombs. Shells cost $100 an inch, with 10-inch shells selling for $1,000 a piece and 16-inch ones costing $1,600, the annual salary of three European white-collar workers. From 1914 to 1918, the ultimate consumer received his goods regularly. No delay in deliveries. FOB Verdun, COD Soissons, the Argonne, the Somme. The munitions makers guaranteed satisfaction. Someone killed with every shot or your money refunded. Maybe. $25,000 the cost of killing a man. 
War scares are the stuff that wars are made from. When the public is war conscious, the munitions moguls prosper. Feverish preparations for war are made on all sides, and that is the lifeblood of the arms business. This year, the world will spend $5 billion for the instruments of war. With the complete motorization and mechanization of the world's armies, this industry has experienced its most prosperous period since the war. Massive new tanks are being built to tear across the countryside. Infantry will be mobile and will travel in these armor-plated fortresses. New amphibian monsters are being turned out which move over land and underwater equally well. Tanks will lay far-flung smoke screens, fire gas bombs, conceal machine guns, and transport troops. Swift, deadly battleships are ready and in construction. Eternal vigilance may be the price of peace, but the battleship into peace. Destroyers can be picked up for about four million. Armor plate costs the United States government about $500 a ton, 33 and a third percent more than Britain pays for her tonnage. Mighty planes rise from great naval airplane carriers, which cost 20 million apiece. The United States leads the world in this type of naval aircraft. In the war, France and her neighbors have taken the lead. Italy's armada of the air is double that of the United States and still growing. Chemists are feverishly experimenting a fiendish competition, each trying to produce a gas more deadly and horrible than any heretofore known. Chemical factories are springing up everywhere, preparing the poisons which will wipe out the civilian front in the next war. It's the masses of the population, not only the soldiers, who will suffer from the next war's chemical output. The populace will live in unremitting terror of terrible lung diseases from germ bombs, of suffocation from chlorine. Gas masks will offer scant protection against these lethal fumes. Tear gases, mustard and lewisite blistering gases, nerve poisoners. There will be blood poisoners too, and incendiary gases. Gases that degenerate the glands and the brain tissues. Gases that blind and kill and choke. All this endless search for more hideous poisons goes on in spite of a ban on gas warfare which the nations of the world ratified in 1908 and reaffirmed in 1925. The foreign offices and war departments of these countries have evidently failed to get together, for the diplomats forbid the use and manufacture of poison gas, and the warlords continue with its ghastly development. Cities will be starved out as these deadly bombs descend to poison food in huge warehouses, to contaminate drinking water, to destroy everything they touch. Every month, the dealers in death proclaim a deadlier gas. It keeps you war conscious. In the devil's laboratory, the bacteriologists are preparing all manner of playful little germs to inflict horrible diseases on whole cities. Germ bombs in harmless disguises are the newest thing. One of these germ fountain pens could bring the plague to the city of New York. Three commercial airplanes could infect the metropolis from Coney Island to the Bronx in three hours. War hysteria is a legitimate business builder for the munitions mogul, a trade stimulant. Patriotic societies everywhere, in all sincerity, organize preparedness parades and demonstrations. Over the radio into millions of homes go fervent speeches designed to arouse the militant spirit of the people. Loudspeakers carry these messages to eager listening crowds. Colorful posters stir the emotions and stampede the nation's youth into a patriotic regimentation under the colors. Passions are inflamed, indignation aroused, patriotism exploited, and the highest of human ideals desecrated by these manipulators of mass hysteria who turn the idealism of a people into inflammatory demands for war. the land and classrooms, the young ideas being taught how to shoot. In Italy, they start them at eight. Just good, clean fun, practicing to be the unknown soldier. Speakers in colleges harangue impressionable youth on the glory of past wars and the preparedness being made for the next. Speakers, speakers everywhere, turning emotion into hysteria, green shirts, blue shirts, red shirts, all heralding the swift approach of the war that is to come. Over the wires flash stories of the need of preparation for war. Linotype operators tap out the message of preparedness. Newspaper presses roar as they carry the story to patriotic, believing citizens. 
All that is needed now is the excuse. And here's as good one as they'll ever find. It worked before, and it'll work again. Now, if you can't afford a first-class billion-dollar war and you want something in snappy second-hand slaughter, there are several spots in the heart of New York which will equip you for plain and fancy killing at bargain prices. Bannerman and Sons is one of these outfitters deluxe to those military powers whose dreams of conquest exceed their financial standing. They'll sell you anything from a Civil War pistol to a battleship. Their store is considered one of the world's finest military museums. They also publish an illustrated catalog of 350 pages, which is a masterpiece of pious justification of their trade. Poems and quotations from the Bible are printed alongside of prices for shrapnel and cannon. Here on an isolated island in the Hudson River is the Bannerman Arsenal and Storehouse, a veritable medieval castle loaded with arms, packed, and ready for shipment. Bannerman is an ancient and honorable firm founded after the Civil War when it bought at auction large quantities of used military goods. Since then, they have bought about 90% of the United States Army's outmoded merchandise at auction and resold it for cash. A small but ambitious nation wants a battleship in a hurry. They can't afford to pay three or four million for a used cruiser. So they buy an old freighter from a junk shop. One of these second-hand dealers in arms gets to work on a complete transformation. When the boat is delivered, it may not resemble the most up-to-date of battleships, but it has a bulletproof vest and can do plenty of damage to the opponent's poor navy, which is of the same origin. Bannerman and others like him are the outfitters for many a small-time war. Small time, in this instance, means any war in which thousands are killed rather than millions. The rifts in Morocco under Abdel El Krim patronized the French and Spanish junk shops. But the big powers soon discovered that a machine gun in the hand of an Arab is a very unhealthy weapon. An African potentate buys up the leftover guns of a European power and starts scaring his neighbors. It's amazing how quickly a backward people can learn to manipulate these firearms. Civil wars and upheavals in various small countries of Latin America equip themselves from these second-hand dealers in death. Uniforms for these warriors are often discarded outfits of some army now dead. Antique and ornate ensembles fetch better prices in this commissary. The purveyors of this type of war material do not stop at guns and uniforms. They even sell bugles, rolling kitchens, and medals. They also try to sell shoes, but these armies prefer to go barefoot. Why waste time winding fatigue? These comic opera soldiers may look as if they stepped out of Gilbert and Sullivan, but their bayonets are of steel and their bullets of lead. The principal customer for this type of armament is usually some brigand who has turned general or some general who's become a brigand. Of course, this second-hand arms trade has its share of troubles. It can't always ship its merchandise over the usual routes. Guns are often contraband, and so shipments of munitions must be smuggled. New Orleans is a real center of gun running operations in the United States, and out of its harbor for many years has sailed a mystery ship, which frequently changes its color and its name, but which is always loaded to the gunnels with a cargo of iron death. There are many fast boats around New York, which load in the dark of night, and then run like bootleggers out beyond the 12-mile limit. Here, they reload their merchandise on regular merchantmen. Once landed at its destination, the cargo, disguised as silks or something equally innocent, is unloaded, and another small-time army is equipped for the job of legalized murder. The Morro Castle disaster, this ship often carried ammunition camouflaged in cases labeled sporting goods. Second-hand guns, when they become too old to be effective, are thrown into the junk heap along with tin cans and old automobiles. And out of these same junk piles, are fashioned the implements of slaughter which will be used in the war of tomorrow. It took 10 years to clean the debris of the last war out of the battlefields of Europe. Old shells were salvaged to be refilled and used again. Mutilated shells were saved for the smelters to be cast into new shapes. And more than 500 lives were lost on this job. 
scraps of iron and all sorts of junk metals are carefully hoarded to be thrown into blazing furnaces and molded into more armaments. Today, this junk is sold at high prices to many foreign countries whose own supply of metals is low. Leaves the harbor carrying a load of contraband munitions and the flag. She is discovered by a hostile submarine far out at sea. A torpedo zings away from the sub into the ship's side, and she sinks, flag and all. The fierce cry goes up that national honor has been violated. The papers foul war. An emotional populace is lashed into frenzy. And war is declared. That torpedo wounded national pride, and so millions of sturdy young men are to be thrown to the maw of death in a war more horrible than can be imagined. The dealers in death have been building for this new war. Modern, terrible equipment is ready and waiting, and the sky is the new war testing ground. Aerial armies have completely changed the character of warfare. Planes a hundred times more powerful than anything heretofore used will zoom out of the sky. Big cities will be their principal objectives. If there aren't enough bombers, mail pilots trained in dropping mail bags will release powerful bombs from converted mail planes. These deadly missiles will swiftly descend to make a gruesome shambles of civilian communities. The sky will be dark with monster planes. Planes so stabilized that landings and takeoffs will be foolproof. Planes controlled by wireless, responsive to the touch of mechanical men miles distant. Planes built to carry heavy loads. A ton of bombs, poison gases, death rays, liquid fire. Long-range anti-aircraft guns will blaze away in a futile attempt to scare off these devils of the air. Thousands of planes equipped with automatic machine guns. Each country's territory divided into aerial wings with a 200-plane squadron for each wing. Swift monsters ready to battle to the death far above the earth. Wing distance and destruction, they will elude high-powered guns from below. Death-dealing bombs will drop from the skies to lay waste to factories, power stations, railroads, food and supply depots, homes, and a mass murder of civilians. There will be no limit to the territory covered in this next war. An entire continent can be spanned in ten hours by these winged demons. Nothing can stop them. Nothing is safe from their onslaught. Countryside and city streets will become blazing infernos as thousands of bombs crash in their midst. Twenty-five hundred dollars a bomb. Ninety-ton tanks are motorized to a speed of a hundred miles an hour. They are manned by high-power machine guns which function with equal precision, whether the tank is in motion or standing still. Infantry, completely mechanized, is machine gun equipped too. Light artillery travels on fast trucks and is even mounted on airplanes. on the sea will be even more deadly and ruthless. Tons of steel will pit themselves against one another in a struggle of merciless and sudden death. Let any object come within the 20-mile range of these powerful battleship guns, and it will be doomed. Each salvo from these huge guns will mean another $25,000 blown up in smoke. Destroyers costing $4 million will scout for hostile $35 million battleships. And along will come a 3,000-ton submarine built for a couple of million dollars to sink both battleship and cruiser. Coast Guard mortars will join the batteries and add to the devastation. Submarines, like the Thames created by Vickers Armstrong, will travel halfway around the world without refueling. It's the fastest submarine in existence. Today's battleship has relentless steel fists. Its guns are loaded and aimed by machine. Its sides are a bulletproof steel made and guaranteed by Bethlehem. The shells it fires are warranted to pierce any armor. Bethlehem also guarantees that. The only real menace to these impregnable Leviathans will be deadly projectiles from huge bombers riding high above. Their iron hulks will be torn into bits by terrific bombs. Nothing will stand up under the aerial onslaught of the future. Fire and devastation will follow in its wake. All vestiges of life will be wiped out. It is doubtful if any will survive to record the horrors of this war.
most horrible of all air attacks will result from the release of gas bombs. The simplest of gases is green crops. This will cause dry land drowning. Your lungs will fill with blood. And after hours of intense torture, death will come as a pleasant relief. Subways and cellars will offer only a momentary refuge to terror-stricken millions whose fear of these hideous gases will stampede them into unbearable, uncontrollable panic. One of the great triumphs of the chemist is mustard gas. This mischievous chemical known as Yellow Cross will cling to your skin and clothing. You will pick it up from the ground as you walk. If you've been anywhere near it, you can infect everyone with whom you come in contact. Eighteen hours after its release, it starts to work. All living substance begins to rot away. For weeks and even months, you strangle. And then death comes from suffocation amid horrible convulsions. Blue Cross gas penetrates every known gas mask and brings on terrific nausea so that off comes your mask so you can breathe. Then the deadly green cross does the rest. Gruesome as these gases are, they're mild compared to the new German product, ironically known as Red Cross gas. Hideous beyond conception in its effect, it beats the best of all other countries. The United States is at present experimenting on another powerful medium for gassing that helpless populace. Called Wind of Death, this new gas hits your warm body and explodes. So that if you're not strangulated, you're blown to bits. The dealers in death have enough steel and iron, powder and chemicals to let loose another hell on earth. And this next war will be more than a hell. It will be a holocaust of all humanity. After it is all over, the DeWendels, Tysons, Krupp, Schneiders, and Zaharoffs will sit down at the director's table and declare a neat dividend for the dealers in death. 